We want to welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Jensen, the director of the Mitchell County Chamber of Commerce. We are the organi organization who coordinates this event as part of our role to connect our business community, our local government, and the general public in Mitchell County. I want to thank those who are joining us this evening, including our local citizens, the candidates, our panelists, and our moderator, Mr. Bob Hensley. Bob has served as the moderator of our forum for over 10 years and has done an amazing job with each event and keeping our event moving smoothly while also being fair and respectful to our candidates. Bob does run a tight ship though, so please know that when a candidate's time is up, it's up. This will be a historic event as our first virtual forum. And so we appreciate your patience and your grace as we try to make this available to all of you who may be watching. The purpose of this event is for citizens to learn about the candidates for the NC Senate election so that they can make educated decisions when voting. We are committed to having a respectful and informative forum this evening, and we ask that our candidates be respectful of, of the moderator, the panelists, and each other, which we know you all always are. And we ask, of course, that our community be respectful as well. Please join us in being a positive influence in our community. With that, I will turn the forum over to Mr. Bob Hensley. Thank you, Patty. And again, welcome to everyone who has chosen to join with us this evening. Uh, we will introduce our panelists at this time. Uh, first of all, from the Blue Ridge Christian News, Mr. Brian Barrier. And with WTOE, uh, helps you wake up in the morning for sure. Mr. Bruce Eichard. And from our Mitchell News Journal, our uh, relatively new to the area, uh, publisher, editor, Mr. Corey Spears. Or is it Spires? Spires? Okay, thank you. All right. A uh, few ground rules that we have here and how we're going to do this. Uh, first of all, we are recording this, and it will be rebroadcast tomorrow at 1 p.m. on WTOE. And as we go through this, each candidate will begin with an opening statement, introducing themselves, stating their positions or whatever they wish to share. They will then be allowed a closing statement at the end of our questioning, again, for two minutes. Each candidate will answer every question during the forum. We're not alternating questions. We're not uh, asking different questions. Each candidate will have an opportunity to answer the same question as it's presented. In a sense of fairness, we will be alternating who gets asked first and who responds, who gets asked first next and who responds. That way, no one has an advantage, as we can see, in being able to rebut the previous answers. So that will be the back and forth as it goes on. Uh, each candidate will be given a minute to answer the question. And Patty will be holding up warning signs. You want to show those? When they get down to where they've got 10 seconds left, Candidates, I hope you can see that on your screen. It should be easy to keep track of. And when the 10 seconds is up, she will announce stop and I will interrupt you. I hate mama didn't raise me to be rude, but I can be here and ask you to please stop at that point. You will be given three, the candidates will be given three rebuttal cards or rebuttal opportunities. We're not using physical cards. If you wish to use a rebuttal, please call my name and call the attention. Just ask for Bob, I'd like to rebut. We'll keep track of how many times you do that and notify you when you have one left. Patty, help me with that if you would, please. Uh, and I think that's pretty much got us ready to begin with this. And as I said, we're going to try to uh, uh, make this as fair and as above board. We ask for respect and courtesy because we're all adults. We're all about issues that affect us as citizens of this community. 
And we want the outcome of this to impart knowledge to the voting public and to our chamber members, obviously, as to your respective stances on issues confronting us. So without further ado, we will begin with Senator Ralph Heiss of the 47th Senatorial District of the North Carolina State Legislature with his two minutes of opening comments. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Patty, and to the Chamber for uh, putting this event on. I wish it was under very different circumstances. I've enjoyed for years doing the in-person debates, and uh, but this is the new world we're living in. Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve uh, the citizens of Mitchell County for almost 14 years now, serving two terms as the mayor of Spruce Pine before being elected to the Senate and now serving almost 10 years. I'm proud to stand and fight for the physical conservative values uh, that we hold in Mitchell County, whether that's sponsoring the marriage amendment or House Bill 2, the bathroom bill, or in this year, the Born Alive Act, uh, to work on protecting our Second Amendment rights, to work on fighting this COVID virus through funding and trying to force this state to reopen and save our businesses for getting new school funding sources for Mitchell County that we've never seen before. This fight is why there's all kinds of organizations like the North Carolina Right to Life, the North Carolina Chamber, the NRA, the Police Benevolent Association, the State Troopers Association, and the School Choice Association that have endorsed me in this race. And I hope I'm privileged to serve, continue to serve you for another two years in a sixth term in the North Carolina Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, if you would, please. Again, uh, Senator, welcome. Uh, good to see you again. And uh, Ms. Jensen, thank you. I know this, uh, being an event person myself, I know this was not uh, an easy task to put together and done a superb job and, and your communication with me has been terrific. And uh, Bob and Brian and uh, Corey and Bruce, um, I'm uh, delighted to see you all again. Um, as many of you may recall, I ran against uh, my opponent in uh, 2018, and he whooped me pretty good. And uh, I did congratulate uh, Senator Heiss for that. And I would like to take, um, you know, this, this may not seem normal, but I would like to take a short period of time uh, to say a prayer for uh, Senator Heiss. Uh, he has lost his mother in the last year, and... and uh, I know that must have been a very difficult situation for you, Senator. I'd also like to uh, do a short moment of silence for all the folks uh, here in Mitchell County, as well as uh, throughout North Carolina and uh, uh, the United States that have passed away from COVID. So if, if you all wouldn't mind, I realize it's a little odd to do this on, on Facebook and uh, Zoom, but maybe we'll take just 10 seconds of my time. And let's bow our heads and, and say, say a prayer for those folks. So that leads me into my first issue is COVID. And it's a big issue that we need some big new ideas for. Um, not only includes getting rid of COVID, but it's going to include helping small business get back to of 100%. We're going to have to help schools get back to 100%. And that's why we need a leader, a leader that is in this district, that's transparent, that shows up, that is not a career politician. I'm in this for... Uh, uh, Mr. Wheeler, you run out of time. I'm uh, sorry. No problem. Uh, we'll begin our questioning now. And Mr. Brian Barrier is going to ask the first question of Senator Heiss. You will have a minute to answer, and then Mr. Wheeler will have a minute to answer the same question. So, uh, Brian, if you would, please, first question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Senator Heiss, how would you grade Governor Cooper's COVID-19 response, and what changes, if any, do you believe should have been made? I think it's not going to surprise anybody that I begin by saying Cooper has completely failed North Carolina. When this incident began and we didn't know what we were dealing with, he really came out with these type of draconian shutdowns. 
But he's held to that policy when we see that our society needs to be open and people need to be able to return to a normal life. I can't imagine the fact that we had a governor in North Carolina who came out and closed churches and threatened legal action against church leaders that continued their services. That's not who we are in North Carolina. This is a strong virus that requires a strong response, but, North, but their Governor Cooper has failed our citizens and is continuing to destroy our economy each and every day. He puts out crazy things like he'll shut down bars that serve food but close restaurants that serve alcohol and allow others to open. Whatever his political whim is of the week, whether it's phase one, two, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, or now phase three, which doesn't actually Thank mean you, Senator, anything. Senator, we're going to have to call you to stop. Okay. All right. Mr. Wheeler, would you respond to that question, please? I'd give Cooper an A+. plus. Uh, out of all the states in the southeast, we have the least number of COVID deaths. We've got one of the largest states in the southeast, but we've got one of the least, least amount of deaths. Secondly, we've got one of the least amount of, uh, we've got the lowest rate of infection. So while the senator likes to beat up uh, somebody that isn't here, I think Governor Cooper, taking all uh, things into account, has done a good job. He's tried hard. And I think the proof is in the pudding. In that, again, we have the lowest death rate in the Southeast. And that's what the governor is supposed to do is to protect our citizens and make sure that folks uh, get the help that they need. And, you know, the Senator uh, is ripping on uh, Cooper for open opening bars, uh, except he voted for the bill to allow him to do that. So again, he's talking out of both sides of his mouth this time around. Okay, I need to respond. Go ahead. You have one. Thank you. Um, Governor Cooper has overstepped any authority he's been given by the General Assembly. The requirements to deal with a pandemic of this required the governor to go to the Council of State and seek the approval of the Council of State before he could enter this. When he found out the Council of State was not going to approve his shutdown, particularly of restaurants based on our agriculture industry, he issued an executive order anyway. When the vote tally came back and he didn't have it, he overstepped his authority, and we are continuing each day to fight through legislation and through the courts to make sure that he stays within the authority he's given and puts the interest of North Carolina first, not his political interest. Okay, thank you. All right, question number two from Bruce, directed to David. Fire away, Bruce. Thank you, sir. Um, since last election, Mission Health uh, was sold to a non to a for profit, excuse me, company that caused a lot of anxiety around health care in Western North Carolina and especially the rural hospitals, uh, many of which are in our district. What changes and measures would you support to ensure access to health care for low income and underserved members of our communities? Thank you, uh, thank you, Bruce. Um, that's a pretty easy one, and and my opponent uh, is part of the problem. We've been offered uh, thirty billion dollars over ten years uh, from the federal government, and everybody thinks, "Oh, they're going to raise our taxes for that." No, that's not true. It's actually been allocated, and we're not taking it. State of Missouri just had a statewide uh, uh, vote and is taking Medicaid uh, expansion money. That would cover about 25,000 people in this district. And, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, Senator, you've got the uh, facts much more at your tips than, uh, fingertips than I do. But 25,000 people would have health care. And the senator, my opponent, is the guy that's holding it up. He doesn't believe that, that, that folks that uh, maybe are down on their luck need a little help. Okay, I'm assuming you're finished. Uh, Senator House. Thank you again. Um, the sale of Mission Hospital is troubling for all of us in Western North Carolina. Any unknown in our health care is a grave risk and that, that system couldn't be more important to us. 
But there are certain things that came out of that transaction that are very beneficial to us as well. The first is the Dogwood Trust. The trust fund that now supports healthcare in Western North Carolina gives us per capita one of the largest trust funds, almost a billion and a half dollars uh, to come into this region to make sure we can improve access to healthcare. And with Blue Ridge Hospital, the sale gave us a guarantee of a 10 year opening with Blue Ridge Hospital. And quite frankly, that's not something Mission was offering us uh, when they were looking to shut down and we, they shut down labor and delivery and began cutting services. So a lot of that sale and transition has been helpful. But I think the most important thing we can do to improve health care is expand providers in Western North Carolina. And one of the Thank ways you, I propose doing that is the same. Thank you. Hey, Bob, I'd like to use one of my lifelines. Um, okay. On one of my cards. So, Senator, I mean, I agree with you that HCA uh, sale was one of the worst things that has happened to this region, but you didn't do anything to stop it. I requested that you hold some town halls with your constituents in both Mitchell, Yancey, and McDowell County, the counties most affected, and you did nothing. You didn't, you didn't even call, uh, uh, call the uh, executives out and ask them hard questions, tough questions. You did nothing. We need a senator that's gonna pound the table and tell them, no, you're not gonna close labor and delivery. Otherwise, here's what's gonna happen. I'm your state senator and we're gonna take some funds away from you. But you don't do it, Senator, because why? Because they give you money. The Hospital Association is one of your biggest contributors and you wouldn't wanna make them mad, would you? Because it's corporate profits, corporate lobbyists, over your constituents every time. I'll go ahead and use card number two and respond to that. Okay. Um, I guess this is a fundamental difference between how my opponent views the role of government and government officials and how I do. That somehow he believes that it is the role of a government official to come in and orchestrate the sale of a private entity or a private business, whether it's a nonprofit or others, that somehow we should control and organize who owns every business and how they choose to operate. it. I believe it's our role to create an environment where those businesses can be successful, whether that's hospitals or doctor's offices or restaurants or any business. Not to say that I want government to come in and say, no, sorry, you own a business, but I'm going to control who you can sell that business to. I'm going to control who can operate that business, or I'm going to tell you what you're going to do in my district. That is just clearly a fundamental difference between the two of us. And Bob, I'll use another one of my lifelines as well to respond to that. Senator, okay. you didn't, didn't respond to the question, why didn't you hold a town hall to get our opinions? Why didn't you uh, hold a public town hall with these executives? Why? It's because the hospital association is in your back pocket, right? Am I right? They're a big contributor of yours, and they were for this. Because why? Because HCA is one of their biggest funders. So rather than take care of the folks and ensure labor and delivery was here, you did nothing, absolutely nothing. And for that, I think folks ought to know, and maybe it's time we started voting for our own self-interest instead of just voting for my opponent because he's a Republican. Obviously, I'm not a crazy person. I'm not a socialist. Do I look like one? Uh, I think it's time we voted for people over corporate lobbyists. All right, thank you. I will point out now that you both have only one rebuttal remaining. All right, we move now to Corey will ask the question of Senator Heiss first. Corey. Senator Heiss, what should be done at the state level to bring high speed internet to Mitchell County and other rural areas of the state? So it's actually something we've been working on for several years at the General Assembly. It's a program we call the Great Program. We actually began with funding by $10 million a year of recurring funds to enter into partnerships between uh, broadband providers and help them uh, access additional funds if they will come into rural areas. 
uh, with the COVID funds. We've added an additional $40 million this year uh, just to begin those partnerships. And so when it's a match, that's really coming to well over several hundred million dollars uh, that we've put in to begin to expand broadband. We're also looking for new technologies uh, as 5G towers become more and more prevalent uh, across the state, making sure that those are getting placed into rural areas. Even now looking at a million dollar study we just put out to deal with new satellite technologies that Elon Musk is putting up that can provide high speed internet across all the rural areas of the state and don't have the additional high cost options we deal with Thank with you, running sir. fiber and lines in these mountains. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wheeler, if you would respond to that question, please. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, so, Senator, you sound like a, a socialist. You're using government funds to bring broadband to folks. Isn't that socialism? I thought you were against that with a ver fervent fever. And what have you done for broadband? All the people that don't have broadband, uh, unfortunately, can't watch tonight. Um, but I, you know what I did when I moved here, Senator? I went to AT&T and said, listen, can we use your lines or use your poles to hang line for country cable on? And I worked my butt off with them. I worked with Heath Shuler. He was at AT&T at the time in Duke. And they allowed us, and it saved country cable $7.5 million, which translated into... 2,500 people getting internet that they wouldn't have had before. And I'm pretty proud of that. Thank you, sir. All right, we move now to question number four. Brian will be asking that question directly to Mr. Wheeler, and then Senator Heiss will respond. Yes, Mr. Wheeler, what do you believe North Carolina's COVID-19 reopening policy should be moving forward? Uh, great question. Thank you, Brian. Um, first of all, I think we listened to the science. I think our uh, uh, Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services in Raleigh is doing a terrific job communicating to us, working with the scientists in the federal government and the U.S. government that haven't been uh, infringed upon or, or overly uh, influenced. So, um, and that's why we elect leaders. That's why we elected Governor Cooper, despite what Senator Heise wants us all to believe. You know, he was elected by popular vote, and we elect folks to represent us and make these sorts of tough ideas or tough decisions. They may not be pleasant, but, you know, unlike my opponent, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to, and I'm going to tell you the truth. This pandemic has got to be knocked out. Otherwise, we're never going to get back to normal. And that starts with leadership. Thank you, sir. Senator Heiss? I think we have to begin with reopen now. I think we have to trust in individuals to make the decisions to social distance and wear masks and to go out in their community where they choose to go and protect themselves. We don't need a government coming in and telling us that where we can go, where we can worship, where we can shop. That's not who we are as a nation. The only science that this governor has been paying attention to is political science. How does he shut down the elections? How does he put himself in a position so that people are looking to him for leadership? Not how does he protect individual rights, which is the most important role of government. How do you protect the rights of individuals? How do you make sure that people can go to worship in the places they want to worship? You put out those guidelines. You help people understand how to clean and open facilities. You join in with them as government. You don't put out regulations that we have to go to a federal court just to get permission to go to our own churches. Thank you, Senator. All right, our next question is from Bruce, and it's directed to Senator Haas. Good evening, Senator. Um, what would you say is the biggest infrastructure need in our district, in the 47th district? 
Well, I actually think that's twofold. One we've talked about already is the need for a broadband infrastructure. Uh, and I think a lot of the things we've put in place are beginning to increase uh, broadband availability in our district. We have a long way to go in the mountains, but I'm confident in a short time that's something we'll overcome. But the other that actually, when you look at building out fiber works along with it, it continues to be our road infrastructure. Uh, hopefully we're just a few months away from finally completing that four lane uh, from Spruce Pine to Asheville. That's been uh, my entire time in office. We've been building that same road uh, that's coming out. And every time they tell me we're close, we're just not quite there yet. But hopefully we're finally going to get over that. When you look at what the governor has done with ruining transportation spending and others overspending almost $750 million, we're going to have a big hallelujah that we got in under the deadline uh, to finish that road. And the last one that's been on my list since the beginning is to finally do something to improve Cox's Thank Creek. you, sir. All right, uh, Mr. Wheeler. Okay, folks. So, um, Senator at least admits he's been in office for 10 years. And he admits there's a problem with broadband. But what is he doing about it, honestly? Senator, What what is it that you're doing to push companies or push funds into the district to get it done because you know there are a lot of folks out here that have been hearing the same thing from you over and over every election every election i'm going to work on broadband i'm going to get the roads done i'm going to get more education funding and you never do it i'm going to take on the big special interests but you never do it you just run for re-election every time and you've gerrymandered this district, so you really don't have to even run. Let's admit that. And I just find it crazy that uh, folks don't put their self-interest above voting for just voting for you because you're a Republican. And I find it very interesting that the solution for broadband is, is companies and government money, but we got to get Governor Cooper out of everything else. And I, I just want, are you running against me or are you running against Governor Cooper? Are you announcing you're running for governor in four years? Is that the deal? You're running against Cooper? Thank you, sir. Are you? Um, <laughs> Mr. Wheeler. Uh, Senator, your response to that? Um, well, I think well, he, I, he gave respond a second time to a I didn't want to use my final card on this, but I will say that, um, yes, I intend to fight to make sure Roy Coopener is no longer governor of this state uh, that's coming in. I'll keep that fight going no matter what. I'm not running for governor, but it is about what we do as a state, not about an individual seeking an office that's coming in. So it's important who the governor of this state is. It's important who the lieutenant governor is. It's important who the judges is. And I'm going to fight in every one of those races to make sure that the values of Mitchell County, which are conservative values, are heard across the entire state. Okay. Thank you, sir. Question now for you from Brian. Senator Heiss, uh, what programs and initiatives can be developed at the state level to address workforce development and unemployment in our area? Hey, Bob. I think you got first last time, so it's my turn. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who would you like to go? <laughs> well, my, my scorekeeping over here has you coming up on uh, – uh, uh, on this next question, and it's showing to be uh, for Senator Heiss. If oh, I've gotten this okay. place, doesn't somebody, matter. Okay. Somebody correct. So, uh, to respond to that, I think the first thing we have to do if we're going to grow jobs and opportunities in Western North Carolina, number one, or across the state, we have to have a tax environment that is competitive. When companies across the nation are looking to locate in states like Florida or Virginia or Texas, we have to be competitive in North Carolina so that we can outpace South Carolina, who also has a lower rate, had a lower rate, and was continuing to put more money into recruiting those industries. Number two, you have to get rid of regulation. You have to get government out of the way. 
When you talk to our construction industries, our mining industries, our production industries like Alltech, you will first thing they will tell you about is how government impedes their ability to do their work. That's what coming in, how it comes in and tries to shut down their operations and take away from them the ability to produce their products. You've got to get government out of the way. That's why we've done a regulatory reform bill every year that I've been in office Thank you, sir. where we do listening to Thank tours. you, sir. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wheeler. Can, Brian, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I, I uh, was interrupting my own self. I forgot. Yes, sir, Mr. Wheeler. What programs and initiatives can be developed at the state level to address workforce development and unemployment in our area? Well, yeah, I think that's a great question. And unemployment is high in this district. Um, I think one of the first things we can do is utilize our community colleges uh, in a better fashion and fund them better, frankly. I think they're a, a crown jewel that we underutilize. I think there are partnerships that we could develop with local businesses to give them uh, you know, more training in how to market their business, how to build their website further, and how to maybe look for additional customers. I also think you need to look uh, long and hard at, at providing these local businesses with uh, grants and funding, and maybe it's matched by the private sector, to help them expand and to bring higher paying jobs into uh, the community. And I, and I think third, that the, one of the other largest things we could do is raise the minimum wage. Uh, it's very difficult for folks to live on eight, nine, ten bucks an hour. Uh, and I think there should be a waiver. for. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. All right. We move now to our next question, which will be asked by Bruce of Mr. Wheeler. The response by Senator Eyes. Mr. Wheeler, uh, What's the biggest challenge that faces the district overall? If you had to say, this is it, this is the big one, what is it? Well, um, COVID. I mean, clearly COVID is the biggest problem right now. And um, I think it's a lack of direction on what is the next step for businesses? What is the next step for schools? Um and again, I know uh, Governor Cooper is doing the best he can, but he needs partners in, a, in this part of the world to help execute his excellent plan and ideas. And I can guarantee you that uh, when Governor Cooper is reelected, he's going to need a partner in this part of the country, part of the state, that actually shows up, that actually participates with, with uh, the community and the citizens. When was the last time Senator Hayes held a town hall. Zero. Zero town halls. Zero communication with the district. So I think COVID's the biggest problem. And secondly, broadband. I mean, we've got to get broadband uh, into the rural parts of this community, and I'll work my tail off to make that, make that happen. Uh, Bob, I think we need to jump back to Corey and the next question. Sorry, Senator Heiss. It's okay. So would you like me to respond? Yes. Okay. Um, and Bruce, actually, I think uh, it's pretty simple. The biggest problem that we deal with in Western North Carolina is government. Uh, you know, when I grew up here, I talk about the number one industry used to be tobacco, followed by furniture and textiles, healthcare workers, small businesses across the things, and then government employees. Well, we saw the federal government come in and buy out the tobacco industry and shut it down. We saw NAFTA and CAFTA come along and shut down the furniture and textiles. We saw the Affordable Care Act come in and take over all of health care so that now the government is about a 90% payer in Mitchell County. And look at COVID. Look at the restaurants we've lost and the businesses that are closing down right now. The gym facilities all across this state who will never reopen because they can't take this kind of hit that government has placed upon them. Our number one employer now is government all across this district and all six counties I represent. It really is government that is destroying the rural parts of North Carolina and the country as a whole. So Bob, I, I'll use my last lifeline. 
Go ahead, David. I'm sorry. I think we've lost Bob for a second. So you go ahead and I'll give me one second and I'll get your time started for you. Okay. Thank you, Patty. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Senator, I, I, again, I disagree with you respectfully. Uh, I think there are, uh, Andy's back. Hi, Bob. Yep. Um, there are a lot of folks in this district that need help. Uh, can you imagine what folks in Mitchell County would have done without uh, the help from the federal government? So are you suggesting that President Trump's $1,200 to families and, and the other relief that he's given to businesses, the PPP funds that have kept doors open were the wrong idea? Well, if that's the case, then I guess you're running against your own ideas and your own party. I believe government that governs least is the government that governs best. Now, there are situations like we're in right now. Is this is an emergency governor or, or a, a governor candidate highs and governments were formed to help us during emergency times. My time's up. Thanks, David. <laughs> I think Bob is trying to get back on. Um, we're going to go to Corey right now. And so I believe the first question goes to uh, Mr. Wheeler. Am I, am I right? That sounds right, Patty. Okay, thanks, Corey. Sorry, between the timing and the card and the, just hang in there with us. Okay, That's so it. this will go to Mr. Wheeler from Corey. Mama, oh. just want everything. So. All right, Mr. Wheeler, what policies can be implemented to protect our natural resources, which make up a large percentage of land in our district? Another great question that uh, obviously with the mining in this uh, part of the world and and other uh, industrial uh, manufacturing that we do, we've got to be very careful with what goes into our water, into the air, and uh, what sort of waste. I think one of the things that I, I have, uh, that I do believe is that the uh, DEQ in North Carolina needs uh, to be reorganized. I think it needs to be uh, funded better. And I think they need more enforcement tools. Right now, uh, their ability to police polluters and uh, fine polluters has been diminished, not only by the federal government, but by the uh, legislature and others. And it's not about eliminating regulations, Governor, uh, yeah, Governor Highs, uh, Governor Candidate Highs. It's about uh, taking care of our folks and making sure that the government uh, safely uh, provides water and, and other uh, natural resources. Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. and Senator Heiss. Thank you. I think um, as we did uh, with Governor McCrory and others under the Department of Environmental Quality, I think you have to change the structure of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources into one who works with business and industries to improve their outcomes. There are no businesses out there that I'm aware of whose goal is to destroy forest land or pollute waters or others. Uh, but we play this gotcha game. We try to hide in the shadows and until we find out if someone's done something or whatever else, shut down and destroy their businesses. We really need to change that environment to where we're all working at the same goal to protect our water and our air. That's why we need to work on forest management projects that make sure that we can have a viable timber industry that provides regrowth coming in to most of our forests and others. And we're not dealing with this fight like California has where they won't let anyone touch the forest and then don't understand uh, why it's burning all over the Eastern coast, Western coast. Honey, I hope I'm back now. Can you hear me? Yep, you're back. And I believe the question comes from Bruce this time. If I well, was the last, the last question was from Corey, correct? Uh, yes. And that went to Mr. Wheeler for his first answer. And then okay. uh, to Senator Heiss. All right, so now we're going back to Bruce, to Senator Heiss. Senator, um, there's a lots, lots of things going on nationally. And this is one that is, if a national turn goes a certain way, then the state legislature would be more involved in this. But if the Supreme Court of the United States overturns Roe v. Wade, would you support North Carolina's laws that allow abortion on demand? I would not. Uh, I think that I am unapologetically pro-life. Uh, I will stand 
for the life of the unborn. Uh, we had to deal with an issue this year where we even tried to pass a bill that said if a child is born alive, that you have to provide medical care for that child. And we had a governor veto that bill and a Democratic Party flip. Even the members who voted for it refused to override and protect that life. I believe strongly in protecting the unborn. And that day, when that day comes that Roe v. Wade is overturned in the United States, I will be proud to stand in the state of North Carolina and declare that we will protect life in this state. Mr. Wheeler. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Bruce. Yes, uh, I'm personally against abortion. Don't believe in it. I've got three beautiful kids. But l let's talk about abortion, folks. What has Senator Heise done in the last 10 years to limit abortions? What has he done to eliminate abor abortions? He doesn't want to. Let's be honest. Because he wants, and his party wants the issue of abortion to divide us. The federal government settled, it's been settled law for 25 years that it's a woman's right to choose. So why do we, why do, why do we keep bringing this up? It's divide up to divide us. So Senator Heiss can ignite his base and, um, you know, we can move down that path. But what has he done over the last 10 years to eliminate abortions? Abortions have not gone down in this district, Senator. They've gone up. Thank you, sir. I would like to respond, Bob. You, you've already used your three. Um, My understanding is I've used two. Yeah, I think Bob actually called on him rather than him using his rebuttal. Okay, well then call on me at some point, Bob. Yeah, yeah, that'll be good. We'll even it out. All right. Um, I just want to point out that I think uh, my opponent apparently has absolutely no idea what my record is uh, on abortion and on the pro-life movement. Uh, while that I've fought for legislation that requires ultrasounds uh, before you can perform an abortion 24 hours, that requires privileges, uh, admitting privileges for abortion clinic before they can perform it, and the horrific things we saw happening uh, in abortion clinics in this state that would ban these late-term abortions, as I spoke about earlier, that would make sure that a child that was born alive would receive medical care. That is why the North Carolina Right to Life has endorsed me in this campaign and has endorsed me for several consecutive campaigns because I stand and fight for the unborn. And quite frankly, my opponent just has no idea what my record is when he says I'm doing nothing to protect life. So, Bob, right, thank you. respond if I can. Is that all right, Patty? Bob. Yes. Yeah, David, they, uh, Bob, Mr. Wheeler would like to um, have a response. All right. So, uh, Senator, I do know what your uh, record is. And all those things that you talk about have not passed. You've introduced them. They're not law. They haven't been instituted. It's just, That's just absolutely not true. You're interrupting, Senator. That's against the rules. Now, calm down, Mr. Trump. Uh, and you know that those things have not passed, and you just use it to divide us. Why not bring us together? Listen, I know I'm kind of a divisive uh, character sometimes, but this is an issue that we shouldn't be dividing on. This is an issue that we should come up with a solution that we all agree on, that respects both sides' opinions. And, and then there's the issue of after children are born. What about pre-K and, and, and postnatal and, and other health care issues for these kids after they're born? Okay, thank you. So I guess with my faux pas earlier, we're even on that stance now. Mr. Wheeler still has one stated rebuttal left. Is that correct? No, oh, I've used all of mine, Bob. Have you used all three of yours? Yeah, I have. And, okay, we won't worry about the freebies then. Uh, I think you were offline for a minute while I used one of them. <laughs> okay. Moving on along now. We're down to Brian, I think. 
if this rotation has sort of gotten a little out of out of uh, control here. But we're back to Brian to ask first question of Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler, given North Carolina's Department of Transportation budget challenges, how would you ensure that local projects in our district are addressed and not delayed? Another great question that uh, obviously affects all of us. It affects economic development. It affects uh, commerce. I think one, one of the things that we need is to relook at the allocation of funding. I think the rural districts get uh, the short end of the stick. It's more expensive to build in the mountains, obviously, than in the Piedmont and other areas. And so I think a reallocation, a reorganization of how uh, funds are allocated would be helpful. But I also think you need a leader in uh, Raleigh that's following every single project and making sure that the project leads there are getting every bit of uh, help and funding they need, as well as uh, the construction folks. Let's make sure that the construction groups like uh, Young and McQueen and others have all the resources that they need to uh, employ folks and uh, add as many possible jobs as they can. Thank you, sir. All right. I think the response now is from Senator Haas to that question. Um, I think it's important to note uh, kind of how we got here. It's probably been six years since we did the major reform of transportation funding projects. And we actually took uh, people like legislators and others out of the process of deciding which roads were built and where they're gone. And we went to a scoring system that looks at things like accidents and safety um, and has a small percentage for congestion to decide where these projects are going and how they're sent there. The problem for the governor in that process is that it laid out for the first three years of the administration which projects were going to be funded. Uh, and so in to order to accelerate that process, he really pushed on all those projects uh, to put more money out the door. And where we find ourselves now is that he has overspent about $750 million in transportation. That's why he had to put a screeching halt to everything from trash pickup to mowing the sides of the roads and others, because we have a funding debacle now because we have Thank $750 million overspent. Thank you. All right, we'll, I'll rearrange my scorekeeping here. Corey, if you would ask this question of Senator Heiss, please. Senator Heiss, what specific steps would you take to support schools and teachers in the future? Well, I think it's a matter of continuing the record we've been on for the last six years. With the exception of what the governor vetoed this year, we've done teacher raises every year for the last six years. We offered a 4.9% raise this year that the governor vetoed. We also took the step of becoming the first time of getting capital money, which is generally a county expenditure, into these rural counties and making sure that's how Mitchell County was awarded $15 million to create a new school, as well as McDowell County. If our budget had gone through and not been vetoed by the governor this time, over the next 10 years, we would have added an additional uh, almost $20 million of Mitchell County alone for new construction and for capital, for improvements. We've always had the requirement that the state will pay for construction and the local governments would pay for the capital. But now we've began to invest in capital as well. So I think it's hugely important that we make sure our teacher salaries, can, salaries continue to be competitive as they are in Western North Carolina. And we make sure that we invest you, in the best facilities we can have. All right, Mr. Wheeler, your turn. Uh, thanks, Corey, for the question. So um, one of the things that I think the Senator I, and I could agree on is that the formula for rural schools needs to be uh, looked at again. Again, I think as most funding for the rural part of this state, we're getting uh, the short end of the stick. But this isn't all, Governor, uh, Senator, this isn't all Governor Cooper's fault. I mean, you guys held the legislature. You had Governor McCrory, right? He didn't redo the formula for schools. You didn't increase the funding. And I'm also confused because government's the problem. You hate government. You don't want government. Government is the issue in this district. 
But then you talk about $15 million. Where did that $15 million bucks come from? Didn't that come from the taxpayers from the government? So, again, I'm confused whether government's the problem or the solution, Senator, because you seem to be talking out of both sides of your mouth. All right, thank you. All right, Bruce, we'll get you back in the game now. Your question directed to Mr. Wheeler. David, again, kind of a, a national thing, but um, what changes, if any, do you support at the state level as far as gun laws in North Carolina? Well, again, uh, it's a federal issue for the most part. Um, I wouldn't change anything. I, you know, I'm a proud hunter and fisherman. Uh, I have a uh, fishing license and a gun license. Uh, I grew up hunting uh, pheasants in uh, Iowa. Uh, proud to have grown up in rural Iowa and uh, like hunting. Um, my kids and I spend a fair amount of time fishing. So anybody that's going to claim I'm anti-Second Amendment or I'm a Bernie Sanders kind of guy on guns uh, doesn't know what they're talking about. So I don't think we need to make any changes. I think we need to make it, uh, we, schools need to be made safer. I think that means training for local uh, sheriff's deputies on emergency situations. We need to give them some funding for that. I also think more school resource officers unarmed would be helpful. And uh, the last thing we need is guns in the classroom. Thank you. All right, Senator Heiss, your response to that question? Well, um, I'm glad to know that uh, I don't know what he's talking about, but in, I don't have a gun license because we don't license firearms in the state of North Carolina. Uh, that's what coming in. I do carry a concealed uh, carry permit in this state, but I think some of the biggest things we can do is open the areas uh, where you can conceal carry uh, within this state. I think it's also important uh, that we focus in this state of making sure that we can expedite the time period that someone can purchase a firearm in this state. Requiring someone to go without a concealed carry to go to their sheriff's office when it can take a week or more, and it's really not the problem in the rural areas, but just now to get an appointment in Wake County to purchase one in the Raleigh area can take months. To get your concealed carry after taking the class could take six months to get the appointment, and by the time the sheriff there gets around to actually issuing the permit could take an entire year because we have areas that are doing everything they can to slow down the issuance of those permits. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, Brian, I guess you're up with a question for Senator Heiss. Yes, Senator Heiss, this would be my fifth and final question to you folks. Um, what can your party do to work better with the other side? And I believe this is my question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, one of the challenges, I think, on a day-to-day -day operation at the Senate, uh, you will see that we spend a lot of time uh, working with across the aisle. I work frequently with Senator Blue and Senator Don Davis, Senator Toby Fitch, uh, to make sure we get legislation we need. Uh, but one of the troubling things that I've seen uh, in this session, particularly out of the Democrats, is that even bills they work together and support. They found it more important to support their governor uh, than it is to do the right policy. I've seen the governor come in and threaten people with primaries and funding within his own Democrat party just to hold the line of partisanship. I'm troubled by how much this nation has moved to split and divide between the two parties. But it's not because that the Republicans aren't willing to reach out on issues or to reach across the aisle to make sure we get something done. It's because so many have decided that creating this divide in order to destroy our president you, is more important than policy. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, again, a great question. I think it's uh, one of the biggest questions in the district is how do we work together? And part of that is talking to each other, not through each other. And I'll be the first one to admit, again, I can be kind of cantankerous, but I listen. I also listen and I correct uh, my way uh, of communicating with folks when I, when I notice a problem. And that's the difference. If folks are looking for uh, one difference between the senator and I, that's it. It's how we communicate to each other. 
It's how we work with others. The senator, uh, and again, I, I'm nothing personal against him. He's a good man. He's got a good family. He's got two great kids. But he points fingers. Listen to him this whole evening. It's Governor Cooper. It's the Democrats. It's the federal government. Get off my back. Well, I'm going to work together with Republicans, like the mayor down in Marion, who supports me, who's a Republican, former chairman of the party down there. And I'll work Thank on you, it. Thank you, sir. All right, moving along. Corey, you will ask this question of Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler, what is one specific state initiative that you feel would best promote job creation for Mitchell County? Broadband. I mean, broadband, 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 broadband. There's no bigger issue other than COVID uh, that could have a bigger effect on Mitchell County and the district if we had some leadership that would go and pound the table and say, listen, we've got a good base here, but we've got, you know, country cables ready to go. They're ready to go into Madison County. They're ready to go into other parts of uh, Mitchell and Yancey, but, and they'd actually go down into the northern part of McDowell. But they need funding because, as the senator knows, it's extremely expensive to lay cable and hang cable in this part of the world. It costs uh, a significant amount of money. And that's where government can help. And that's where I differ with my opponent. I believe the government ought to, like we did uh, in the 30s, uh, 20s and 30s, uh, with the electrical co-ops. Let's do that again with broadband. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator? I think the number one thing we can do to increase business in North Carolina and in this rural area is to eliminate the franchise tax. Um, it is one of those taxes in North Carolina that is the most insane in principle. The franchise tax means if you invest in a new facility in North Carolina, you are immediately taxed on the value of that facility. It's almost like a property tax at the state level for businesses. If you have a multi-state business in South Carolina and North Carolina, if you locate more employees in North Carolina, we penalize you through the franchise tax for doing so. If you locate more uh, metal in the ground, we penalize you for doing so. It is a regressive tax. And as we have gone year after year in reducing the tax burden, it is the one area in this state that continues to make us non-competitive against our surrounding states because we charge such a draconian franchise tax. Um, it even applies when you get down to barbers Thank that you, have sir. to pay so much for Thank each you. chair. Thank you. Bruce, you have questions left? Yes, sir. All right. It's your question directed to Senator Haas. Senator Haas, I'm, how important is it for the state, for you to be able to work with the local governments, uh, either in Mitchell, we're in Mitchell County, of course, looking at this tonight. Do you feel like you have a pretty good relationship with those folks and how important is that relationship? You know, one of the hardest things about the 47th district is our geographic spread across representing six counties, um, I think 14 municipalities within those counties. Uh, that's what coming in. It's a lot of local government officials. Uh, and quite frankly, I think having those personal relationships with them, picking up and picking up the phone and calling and talking to county commissioners. I interact with them frequently at party meetings and others to find out what's going on, to talk to their economic development directors across six counties is something I do on a regular basis. I sit down and meet with superintendents that are willing to meet with me about what's going on in their schools. There's a lot of local governments. I came out of local government. My first my first two terms was mayor of the town of Spruce Pine and into the fight with my state senator is what brought me into this to begin with. So as we're coming in, you've got to have that relationship. We've seen a lot of changes in this district uh, over the last 10 years uh, in leadership at the local you, level, sir. the county level, Thank and you. the municipality. Mr. Wheeler, your turn. Uh, thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Bob. So, again, uh, Senator, you've been in the state Senate for 10 years, correct? You complained about the franchise tax. You know nothing about it. You controlled the Senate. You controlled the House. You controlled the governor's office. Why didn't you get rid of it? Why? It's because, uh, frankly, you know, your leadership style doesn't seem to work. And for some reason... 
you can't get things done. And I don't know why. Uh, again, you're a nice person. You're extremely intelligent. But you complain about the franchise tax, but then you don't do anything about it. I'm actually, I agree with you on that issue. I think franchise tax is, is ridiculous. I think taxes on small businesses less than a half a million dollar a year should be eliminated. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm done. That's it. No problem. All right. Thank you. All right. Corey, have you got questions left? I do. I have two left. All right. Corey, question directed to Mr. Wheeler. Okay. Mr. Wheeler, what does a post-COVID-19 District 47 look like in your eyes? Uh, good question. Um, uh, I hadn't thought about post yet because we're so deep in, deep in it right now. Well, unfortunately, I think we're going to have a lot of repair to small business. A lot of businesses are going to be in uh, deep trouble. And that's where I think I can help the most. I am a small business person. I've spent my life uh, since I was 24 years old, I've worked for myself. I worked in the private sector. Um, unlike my opponent, I don't have a state job. He has two state jobs. Uh, and, you know, he calls folks that need government help uh, welfare kings and queens. Well, he's the only person on this call Never said it. Who's, who has two government jobs. Correct, Senator? I don't live off the government. Um, and so I think helping small business is going to be a big deal. I've got some ideas. If you flip over to my website, wheelernc.com, you'll see more. All right. Thank you, Senator. You know, I really hope that we can take uh, this COVID epidemic and really learn from uh, what we want from a government, and what we want in a society. Um, I hope that following November, we will finally reopen and allow restaurants to begin to fully serve again, to allow churches uh, to open and meet as they see fit, to be able to congregate and have a debate in the old courthouse as we've done for the last 10 years. That's we're coming in. I hope that we learn that our school system, that we never need another snow day, uh, that we now have an alternative to make sure that we're not canceling education every time three flakes fall from the sky. But we cannot step back and say that we are going to success, accept in a society a governor that tells us when we can open a restaurant, when you can open a movie theater, when you can open your church and others. And we make sure that we have set the authority of the governor to make sure that in these pandemics, you, he sir. can't use this to take our freedom. Bruce, have you got more questions? No, sir. Brian, have you got more? No, sir. You said you were done a while ago? Yes, yes, I'm out okay. of question. Corey said you've got one more? Yep, one more over here. Okay. Now, keep me straight on my timing here. Uh, Corey, you will be asking this question of Senator Heiss. All righty. Senator Heiss, uh, this one's simple. Do you support raising taxes in North Carolina? No. I don't think anybody's surprised by that, but no. <laughs> okay. Succinct answers. Uh, Mr. Wheeler. Heck no. We got enough taxes. We've got enough tax revenue coming in. I think we do need to cut the franchise tax on businesses. Uh, I think we need to cut small business taxes. Being a small business person, again, I, I think the the greatest impediment to expansion for a small business is that personal income tax that, you know, flows through to you at the end of, end of every year. And the state of North Carolina has cut it over the last uh, five or six years, but we need to cut it more. So I'm not in favor of that. And I'll work my tail off with Republicans and Democrats if there's a Republican governor after this election or if the Democrats uh, don't take control of either of the House, I'm gonna work my tail off to reduce taxes on businesses because I come from the business world. I'm a small business person. I've created jobs, unlike my opponent, and I don't have two state jobs that I live off uh, to pay my bill. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. 
All right, this concludes our questions since we've run out. And as I stated at the beginning, we will reverse our order. So, Mr. Whitler, you have two minutes to make your closing statement. I think it was Mr. Heiss was going to go first. Okay. Uh, if that's what you want. Um, well, no. You know, again, I want to start off and say thank you all uh, today for uh, this opportunity uh, to be here to do this forum. I hope that the day comes very soon uh, where we're doing these in person again and uh, making sure that we get the opportunity to interact by doing so. Uh, but I think you've seen a very clear contrast tonight. Uh, when you look at how Mitchell County and Western North Carolina feels about things like the role of government, how they feel about life and abortion, and how they feel about guns and taxes, operation and defending the Second Amendment. I think it's clear how they that there's only one candidate here that represents Western North Carolina and its values, that will continue the fight to reduce taxes and reduce government, as I've done over my 10 years in the General Assembly. We went from 44th in tax environment to 11th best tax environment in the nation. That's the record over 10 years. There's only one candidate here you heard that, that will stand and fight for the life of the unborn. And I guess now of the born as well. That's what could be it. That will make sure that we reduce the abortions in this state and continues to pray for the day when we end abortions in the North Carolina and in this nation. I have lived here all my life. I was born in Spruce Pine Hospital. This is my home for eight generations in Western North Carolina. I will continue to stand for this region and I will continue to fight in Raleigh every day that I'm there to make sure that our values become the values of the entire state of North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Whaler. Yeah, and Senator, I apologize for talking over you. I was a little bit of a delay there. Well, thank you again, Patty and, and uh, Brian, Bob and Corey and Senator Heise for being here. God, guns, and gays. That's all the senator ever talks about. That's all he has to talk about. He said publicly, God, guns, and gays is his entire platform. He has to bring that up. It'll excite his base. It'll bring folks out. It'll divide us. First of all, I have no problem. I'm a proud Christian. I pray. Uh, I've been to many churches in this uh, part of the uh, country. And Governor Cooper has never stopped anybody from going to church or praying, uh, exercising their right to faith. And I would never be for it if he did. First one to call him and tell him he's an idiot. Gays, they're human beings. They're people. They're God's children, whether you like it or not, Senator. I know lots of gay folks. And every time you scream about bathroom bills, do you know how that feels to a gay person? or a lesbian, that hurts. And guns, nobody's gonna take away anybody's guns. I'm not gonna let them. And if Governor Cooper tries, I'll be the first one to show up in his doorstep and tell him it ain't happened in this district. So you're right, Senator, we have seen a contrast this evening. I'm a guy, I can be a little cantankerous, but I love North Carolina, my kids are we're all born here. We're staying here. They're being educated here. I'm not going anywhere. And I'm a proud American. I'm a son of a Marine, son of a quilter, and I'm a proud North Carolinian. And I'd really like you to uh, consider voting for David Wheeler, even though I'm not a Republican, because I'm going to get things done for every one of you, not just corporate lobby. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, a little housekeeping to get, get us done here. First of all, uh, if you wish to hear this again tomorrow, tune in to WTOE, 1470 AM radio dial. And our technical wizard there, Mr. Bruce Eichard, will make that available to you at 1 p.m. tomorrow. Special thanks go out, first of all, to Patty and the Mitchell County Chamber for continuing this tradition of uh, a forum. Uh, second of all, I make apology for my faux pas there in the middle of it. Uh, 
uh, I lost my place, so to speak. And then in trying to keep up with the candidates, I lost my visual on, uh, on, uh, on the cell phone. And we won't go into the reasons for that. But Brian, thank you for taking time and uh, encourage people to avail themselves to your fine publication, the Blue Ridge Christian News. Bruce, as always, uh, you're the, uh, uh, the wonderful voice of WTOE and hosting uh, the morning show up through midday, and we appreciate you for that. And Corey, you've taken on the wonderful job of publisher and editor of our, our local newspaper, which has a long storied history, and we appreciate you becoming a part of our community. And for all of those and all of that, uh, Again, candidates, thank you for being a part. And as was said by both, I truly hope we can come to a point in our next election cycle that we can come together face-to-face uh, -to -face in the old courthouse. Uh, that's become a bit of a home for this. But again, thanks to the chamber and thanks to all of you. And we look forward to your participation in the greatest right we have as Americans, vote. However you choose to do it, vote. I hope the information we've provided you helps you make a decision, but still vote. Thank you. I want to thank Bob thank before you. we go. I want to thank Senator Heiss, Mr. Wheeler, both of you for giving of your time this evening. I know this isn't anyone's first choice to do a virtual forum. We all like being together, um, but these are not normal days right now. And so we're doing the best we can to make sure that our citizens could hear from both of you before they start to vote. Again, early voting is this coming week. Um, I do want to say um, for those who are watching or who may watch this back on our Facebook page, um, I think that the live stream may have dropped a little bit in the beginning. I did get it back on. And so please be sure to tune in to WTOE tomorrow at one so that you don't miss, if you missed the very first question, that was asked tonight and the two candidates answers be sure to listen to WTOE tomorrow at one so you can see or not see but hear what they had to say thank you all again for participating thank you all who may have tuned in and listened and watched um, at the chamber this is an important event this is something that we take seriously and it's something